Rohingya Union and also the founder and chairman of the Burmese Rohingya Association of North America, which covers also the United States, Canada, and Mexico. So without further ado, I would like to invite Professor Wakarudin. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much for giving the opportunity to speak in front of the esteemed audience, in front of His Excellency Dr. Mahathir Muhammad. This is a great opportunity for not only for our Rohingya Union and the Burmese Rohingya Association of America, it is an opportunity for Rohingya people worldwide to make their case why what we are asking from Burmese government, the, what the kind of rights we are asking for. Some of the speakers, distinguished speakers earlier, has covered quite a few things that I'll be covering also. So, uh, but again, we like to be redundant. We like to send the message time and again. It does not, it does not hurt to say uh, critical issues time and again, so that message will keep going on. I originally, this slide was not to put earlier uh, uh, from my talk, but uh, following uh, Dr. Uh, Hague Ex Excellency, Dr. Mahathir Mohammed's comment about America, I put the slides on about Brana because uh, this is the organization we founded and this is the organization we are working with U.S. government very closely with State Department, Senate Foreign Relations and uh, uh, House Human Rights Commission. I want to assure you that we have garnered the support from the United States government to the fullest. We know we have some uphill battle because of the corporate America is interested for investments, all the things in Burma, so we have to have some have uphill battle, but we are, uh, the American government is convinced that they are with us, they are going to fight for us, uh, with their, conforming to their policies. Uh, our Karyuhanga Union, I, I must have, when I was contacted by the organizer, they did mention in the email that I must cover this organization a little bit to speak uh, how how we are, how, how this organization is working for Rohingya people. Our Rohingya Union is a global a confederation organization consisting 25 different Rohingya organizations throughout the world. This is the legitimate organization of Rohingya people, representing Rohingya people. But I must stress that how much we have achieved in the 17 months will be phenomenal. Today you are seeing OIC in Burma, working with Burmese government. The Burmese government has accepted OIC to work with as a legitimate organization and, and ARU is instrumental. And ARU is an NGO registered in the United States as an NGO, non-governmental organization. And we're operating out of the out of United States, but we have organization throughout the world in coordination with. Very quickly, a structure of ARU, we have five departments, five coordinators, as you can see there. And then we have a coordination council, regional-based coordination council, to coordinate the activities. And then we are going to have soon advisory council, advisory board. A mission of ARU is, first mission is that we always talk about citizenship. That's what we, we want to regain our citizenship. I want to stress the word regain. That's what we want to reclaim our citizenship that was taken away from us. That's first objective. Second objective is to improve the living conditions of Rohingya in Burma. And third objective is uh, to have a better protection, not only for Rohingya people, but also the Muslim community at large in Burma. And how do we do that? How do we achieve our goals, our mission? How do we do that? So we have to develop the strategies. First strategy is dialogue. We are, uh, ARU's first objective is to uh, dialogue with Myanmar government. But Myanmar, not only Myanmar government, other entities in Burma, uh, NLD opposition groups, ethnic minorities, including Rakhine. If there are elements in the Rakhine community that wanted to talk to us, we are ready to speak to them. We also, we also want to mobilize international community to support Rohingya community. That's second objective of ORU. And third objective is build the, build the capacity of Rohingya people. That's, ba that's, basic, that's basically about ARU. But I want to revisit some of the things we've been hearing this morning and in the past. This, this cannot be ignored. Who are we Rohingya? I'm going to use only one slide, two slides to show that.
Okay, that's that's Rohan region of Arkan here. You can see. There's the Rohan region of Arkan, and the Rohingya are they are native of the Rohan. I want to emphasize this. I'm repeating this because this is a strong message we want to send out to international community. So that Rohan region is original people of Arkan. That's why we call it ethnic minority. We are ethnic. We are ethnic people, indigenous population of Rohan, where our background goes back to South Asian. Caucasus region and Middle Eastern region. We are mixed. We have mixed background of different and, and, and uh, part of the world. People from different part of the world. And you can see that is region is right there, a small uh, region of Northern Arkan State where the Rohan is. And then people often ask, okay, all the Rohingyas, all the Muslims in Burma are Rohingya. I clarify that to reemphasize that point. No, not all the all the uh, Muslims are not Rohingya. Roughly, about 50% of Muslims throughout the country here are non-Rohingya, and Rohingya is another roughly 50% total, composing of three million together. Here, Rohingya about 1.5 million as of today. But Burmese government claimed that it is only 800,000, and you know the reason. I don't need to explain that. I want, to I want to show you this slide, uh, the, the citizenship, the history of Rohingya. This is a newspaper cut from 1960-61. You can see there, the, this is Rohingya, Mayu and in, in 1961, the Burmese government made a truce with Rohingya activists, we call it insurgency or freedom fighters, they are calling for a Mayu Nechakayai, a Mayu district. So Burmese government came to a negotiation with them, came to a negotiation with them, and then declared that Rohingya here, in their writing, here Rohingya, these are the citizens of Burma, and they made the truce, and you can see here, written July 18, 1961. These are documented. These are documented that Burmese government has recognized Rohingya as, as a legitimate citizen of Burma, and then we had a radio program in, in Burmese government media uh, broadcasting Rohingya program. Now, center of Rohingya issue. What, what, what is happening? What is happening there? What is Rohingya issue? Of course, it's ethnic cleansing. Everybody knows by definition it's ethnic cleansing, and 60 years in the making. And these, some of the conduct, some of the violations of human rights by the Burmese government has amounted to genocide. You look at the dictionary, definition of genocide, that fits. Well, Burmese government and many others, uh, even some NLD, claim that this is an immigration issue. This is not an immigration issue. You can take out an I, you can put in an E. Emigration. People are leaving. 1.5 million people have already left. So this is not an immigration issue, this is an emigration issue. If you want to say it's an immigration issue, there will be a kind immigration. You know, last 20, 30 years, thousands, estimated 80,000 Rakhine has entered from Bengali Rakhines, from Bangladesh, has entered our kind of state, uh, and entered there and settled there. Border issue, what's border issue, what's happening with border issue? They need to explain that. So these are all pretexts. They know that's not true. They want to eliminate the Rohingya population. And then they said, these are border issues, these are immigration issues. I'm not going to through this, but I want to point out there are at least 17 items, points that you can make about ethnic cleansing and uh, genocide. Uh, you go through this. If this does not fit ethnic cleansing, if this does not fit genocide, what will be genocide? There's more. More of these are happening on a daily basis that cl clearly defines ethnic cleansing as well as genocide. So why, why current violence? So you have a gentleman this morning, the, the panel has covered, so I'm not going to detail that, that this race issue is an ethnic race issue, a cultural issue, cause, and religion. These are a combination of three, uh, you know, fitting into each other, that's causing that ethnic cleansing and genocide. Democracy is reform right now. Obviously, some of these ultra-nationalists, 
radicals in Burmese uh, hardliners do not want democracy to flourish in Arkan so that human rights issue cannot be addressed. They want an unstable Arkan. If there is instability of the region, there will be massive population movement. People will move, start moving to Bangladesh again like 1978 and 1992 and other times. So they want unstable Arkan. That's what they want so the population movement can go, uh, take place. State rape case, Dr. Zani has covered this morning. I'm not going to do that. That's what they have done that. And it is not a secret. President Thin Singh has spoken that these people are not citizens. They need to be transferred to third country. They are national security threat. They need to be kept in camps. What else do we need? Is that is not ethnic cleansing? Is not the genocide? What is then? So this, this is documented. Relentless for false uh, media campaign. You know what kind of things they put on Myanmar government's information ministry? I'll give you a quick example. A couple of months ago, I looked up the information ministry site. It said a man put four wives and 28 children. They put their name. So we made phone calls. You know who the man was with four wives? The man, that four wives, young wives, he said. Three of them are his daughter-in-laws. They killed their, husband, their sons and one of them was daughter. So he was giving the shelter to three daughter-in-law with children and one daughter and children in his home. And the Burmese media campaign, false media, has portrayed them that this man has married to young women, now who will their daughter, his daughters, and 28 children. So that's how the, what kind of false media, pro one example, one example, I'll give you 100. So, so what, how this started? Really, if you look back, before 2010 election, Rakhine has been gathering arms, ammunitions, all this arms you know, to start violence. They wanted a violence and to, to take place. So what they did, over the time, in two years, when, the, when things are moving quite well, reform, they look for triggering point. They want something to explode. So they look for triggering point, and what they decided that they need a mass reaction from Muslim community, Rohingya community. So they want to provoke Muslims coming out of the masjid during Juma prayer, and that's how they started. They provoke the mass reaction. It quickly moved to other cities in the Rakhine state and in the country. That clearly indicates that this pre coordinated, pre planned. Otherwise, it cannot spread so quickly. 78 people got killed. Can you believe that? As of today, Myanmar government is claiming that because you make the judgment. Now, police is doing the violence. They are arresting people, Rohingya, hundreds of them, keeping in the jail, torturing them, killing them, and there are reports of disturbing reports of the, the uh, the dead bodies coming out of those jails. Think about Lawadong, who did outside, notorious Lawadong jail. You heard the whole story about Lawadong jail. Rape cases. Particularly those houses, there's no man left. The, uh, the police forces inv will invade those houses and commit more, uh, rape. And policemen are during the day, they are wearing the uniform at night in civilian clothes. They join the Rakhine mob and looting and conducting violence. As, as you know, a lot of mocks have been burned and gutted down and which are still remaining, they lock them up. So what do we, what do we want? What do Rohingya people want to solve this issue? Uh, from our Rohingya Union point of view and Burmese Rohingya Association of North America point of view, I think that we needed to put concerted pressure on Burmese government. One country here, they, they are one country here, one organization here, they are not going to budge. They are arrogant. Burmese government is arrogant. They are not going to budge. So international community need to come together as concert. I went to, uh, I was invited to uh, His Royal Highness uh, King Abdullah Summit last month. And that's the same case. When they came together like that, that's what we want to see, like OIC did. Uh, ASEAN maybe do the same thing. Uh, but we have to do multi-track approach. Not just ASEAN, not just OIC. Western countries, even NATO can come in, United Nations. This is a government that will not listen to even one group. They are determined. So international community need to be mobilized and put pressure on Burmese government to stop 
kill, killing Rohingya people, extrajudicial killing, arbitrary arrest and torture. Cease hostility against Rohingya. Burmese government need to change their position. They are the key. They are using Rakhine. Uh, part of the game is that they are using their kind. They need to change the position. They need to come to the center and the hostility against Rohingya and be a honest broker. If there's a communal riot, you come in the middle, you resolve it, you facilitate the peace process. And then United Nations international community need to install, it need to appoint its own commission of inquiry, not the one which is doing right now in Burma. Relief supplies and all that they needed international monitoring team and media, international media has to be present. These are part of the solution because, you know, we cannot keep just talking citizenship. Before we get there, citizenship, there are immediate need. People need to live, people need to survive so that they can reclaim their citizenship. If these people are dead and gone, who, what's going to do with citizenship? So citizenship is a very important issue, but we have addressed some immediate needs before we, while we are working on citizenship issue. The most alarming thing right now is Rakhine Police Force. It got to change. It got to change without changing a kind of police force. Uh, we do not see how we're going to solve that. So we ask Myanmar government, international community should pressure in concert, international community should pressure Myanmar government to disband this police force. 25 years, 30 years, this police force, same Mongo, same Budidong, they have been extracting money, extortion, all that. They will never get out of there. So they dis Myanmar government must disband this police force and bring new police force with other ethnic minorities, Kachin, Karen, all that, maybe somewhat neutral, and there's no Rohingya in police force. The Rohingya has to be in the police force. Otherwise, who's going to protect Rohingya people? Prisoners, they have to release it today. They must release all these prisoners unconditionally because there's no charge against them. You go to monasteries, Pongji Chang and others, you see arms, loads of arms reported. They have to be confiscated by the Burmese government. We ask them, go and find them, get this confiscate them, and prosecute those Pongji, whoever they may be, holding these arms in the monasteries, piling the armies in monasteries. And Rohingya people in the camps, they need to return to their home. If their houses are burned, they have the property. They can put up, put up a tent if they don't have a house on the property. That we're going to start from there, and they, they must be protected. So, th there's, there's not a solution. Three years keeping these Rohingya uh, folks in their camps for three years, that's not a solution. They need to be brought back to their properties. There's no, uh, they need to be integrated in the society, in the community, like, just like before. Of course, citizenship law, 1982 citizenship law. Although I'm saying this last, it's very important. But as I said before, we really need to get some work done before we. We, we uh, fight for citizenship, uh, a picture worth a thousand words. So I'm going to show you so that I don't have to take too much time talking again, showing the pictures. You have seen it, but it's a reminder, okay? You have seen these pictures, it's a reminder, message has to continue. You know, there's a great gathering. We go home, everything is done, we cannot die, it cannot die down. We have to sustain this effort. International community has spoken, worldwide. So we have to sustain this effort, just like this event, there are other events, it's going through United States. This is my fifth presentation this week alone. But it's maybe too much. We have to do this throughout the year. The ethnic cleansing. You see, the form here. This is official document of Myanmar government. Tracking Rohingya ethnic cleansing. You can see all, I translated the English here. It's all bona fide citizen, how many people below this age. All this they are tracking how they are tracking the population, the depopulation. That's why a lot of refugees there in Bangladesh, a lot of refugees in India, in Thailand, uh, children, homeless children, see no education for these kids, just collecting the woods. Look at the settlement, Nasaka. Nasaka settlement, model village. Natala, we call it. It's Rohingya's land, these are houses are built, all brought in Rakhine and Burma from other part of the country and Bangladesh also. And then these houses were not built by Burmese. These houses were built by Rohingya. They made Rohingya forced labor to make these houses. In Budidong, that's the, that's the settlement area where they had to, to transplant the Rakhine. This was in Mongo. Okay? This is, these are all what you are seeing. Also, they are planning to have settlements, all these areas here. 